Hello everyone, welcome back, and apologies for the gremlins there. Um, I'm sorry if you have my frozen face on your screen for longer than was bearable. Um, so apologies for that. I'm going to just start from the top. So just to, just to remind you, I'm Simon McCallum. I'm Archive Projects Curator at the BFI. Thanks so much for joining this session. Um, the BFI National Archive looks after one of the biggest and most diverse and richest collections of moving image in the world. We're talking over a million films, film and TV items and extensive paper collections. So we're really keen to sort of increase ways of, 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 of access to the collections. Um, like any vast institutional archive, there are complexities and challenges around access, not least on rights, but we're hoping to start to demystify uh, what's in the BFI collections for you and ways of working with us and also show you some of the ways we've been working with broadcasters, filmmakers and producers on various projects over recent years. If there's time, we'll give you a quick snapshot of some educational non-commercial projects as well. So we've been working on some major digitization projects over the past five to ten years, not least one called Britain on Film, which you can explore on BFI Player for free. There's over 10,000 films from both the BFI and our partner archives around the UK, searchable by location and also curated into thematic collections. So I'd urge you, if you haven't already looked on there, to, 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 to get stuck in. We're also now currently in, in the midst of a even bigger project to preserve and digitize 100,000 at-risk videotape items from, from all of our collections. Um, and as part of that, next, later next year, we'll be launching quite an exciting new digital platform in libraries around the UK. In the meantime, you can access over 100,000 film and TV titles in our media tech at BFI Southbank. And this is material that, for mainly for rights reason, we're, we're not able to put online currently. So if you can get down there, it's well, well, well worth it. Um, and along with our searchable collections database, we're, we're really sort of starting to enable greater access to an understanding of our collections and what's dig digitized both in venue and online. So there are a lot more resources at your, at your fingertips now. So I'm going to introduce my three esteemed colleagues that are joining for the session today. I'll actually ask them to briefly introduce themselves and what they do. Um, why don't we start with Gillian? Would you like to say a bit about... Myself, yes. Uh, yes. Hello, everyone. Um, <laughs> yes. So I'm uh, the BFI's Broadcast Partnership ma Manager, and I work across all of the BFI, from the, all the sort of seasons, uh, all right through to the archive. And what we look <laughs> for is narratives that we can sort of think are really exciting and, and stories that we really want to tell about film and TV and film culture. And we connect it with broadcasters, commissioners, producers, and we work very closely with them so that we can amplify film and film culture out to a wider audience. Brilliant. Thanks, I'll pass it to John. Yeah. Oh, we're doing John next. We're in a different order. Go for it, John. Hi, all. I'm, hi, I'm, I'm John Carino. Uh, I work in archive content sales. So part of my role means I have to source content from a national uh, film archive, uh, license it. So that means I'm having to talk to production managers and discuss kind of like licensing rates. And then the third part is looking at the materials themselves, uh, you know, with all technological requests for the content and in making sure that uh, they get the deliverables that they need. And I guess we move on to Annie now. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hello, everyone. Afternoon. I'm Annie Shaw. Annabelle Shaw. Um, I work in the rights and contracts team at the BFI, uh, so we are really akin to a sort of business affairs department, um, but my role focuses primarily on the uh, archivization projects that um, Simon mentioned and the rights research and clearance for those, so the BFI can make its collections available. Um, I also do a bit of rights management and a lot of rights research on the archive collections, which is um, what I'll be talking about today. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. So I thought we'd start with a quick whiz through some of the, the key collections that we look after. So my first question is really for John around, would, would you just give a bit of an overview of some of those major collections that are unique to the BFI and that we look after and represent and, and, and that you deal with sort of on a day-to-day -day basis in your work? Yeah, well, as we know, I mean, the, the BFI National Archive is such a vast collection of very unique materials. Um, from a licensable point of view, what we really specialise in is British social history spanning over 100 years. So from the very beginning, chronologically, we'd be looking at, you know, our 
comprehensive collection of Victorian cinema materials. So we'd be looking at 1895 to 1901. There's some gorgeous like bits of material like, you know, from Queen Victoria at Balmoral and the Garden Party. Um, recently, and we can touch upon this later, um, you know, we digitized 500 films which were published on the BFI's video platform, BFI Player. So just after that, we'd be looking at, say, early actuality material from the likes of Mitchell and Kenyon. So, you know, they, they, they were filming like everyday scenes, specifically in the Northwest and Yorkshire. So we'd be looking at materials like factory gates, um, processions and sporting events. And then further on from that, then we can look at industrial films, the likes of Mining Review, GPO, which talked about, you know, the progress and, you know, highlighting um, their respective industries, the post office, um, technological advancements there. Um, gosh, I can carry on talking about COI as well, the Central Office of Information, um, which is government and information films from 1930 to the present day. Um, some very key titles there. One of them's like uh, the HIV ad, with the narration from John Hurt, um, and, you know, the Charlie Says material. Um, there's far more I can think Arts of, but that kind of gives you a brief idea. Yeah. That, that's, and in fact, <laughs> that's a perfect segue into a little showreel we've got, which, and we don't want this to be some kind of hard sell, but I think this little archive sales showreel does give you a nice little snapshot of, of some of these kind of major collections that we're looking after. So could, could we have the first clip, please, if it's ready? It's the... Brilliant. Thanks for that. And it's also worth saying, maybe, John, that we, we, our collections are sort of international in scope, both in terms of actual their content and also the projects that you, you guys are working on. Absolutely. Um, you know, back in 2014, the BFI worked on a project where I think it was for the China season. We delved into the archives and were able to publish a load of like uh, you know, Chinese content from the first 50 years of the century and um, did so well and released a DVD. And as part of that, we were in contact with Channel News Asia and Mail Films Productions. And we were able to produce a series called China on Film. And that led to another um, documentary called uh, Singapore on Film, both of which have done really, really well in the international documentary uh, market. Um, but yeah, it just goes to show that we're not entirely focused on just British collections, but we do have a lot of content that was filmed overseas and is preserved at the BFI National Archive. Brilliant. Um, is there, are there any particular projects that you've licensed to or worked on your team that people will have seen recently? Because I think there's been a couple of a couple of TV docs that, that this BFI material has appeared in. Yeah, we built up a really good relationship with uh, Rogan Productions, um, Steve McQueen, exact two of the productions which have been broadcast on BBC. One of them is Black Power, which looked at the rise of like black resistance movements in the 60s, and the other one, Subnormal. Um, and it's those productions which we work very closely on because, you know, they chime with our collections, especially those within the black British film collection that we have. Um, we also worked with Blast Films for a BBC uh, One documentary called Silence, his, kind of like charting the history of, of disability in Britain. So, you know, three really, really important productions and, you know, long may it continue. Great. And you can explore more in our, there's a, a Black Britain on film and a Disabled Britain collection on, on BFI Player. And the, the Black Britain collection goes right back to pre-Windrush Windrush days as well. So it's a really important resource, really rich resource there for you. So, so those are two collections that I definitely urge you to explore. So I'm going to move on to Annie and talk about rights. Now, the collections that John's mentioning are those that are tend to be slightly easier for us to license more directly for, 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 for sort mm -hmm. of creative reuse and for, for broadcast projects. But do you, do you, would you be able to talk a bit more about some of the broader legal challenges of working with a moving image collection as, as diverse as ours? Because it, it has its major bonuses and its challenges because it's such a, such a huge yeah. kind of treasure trove of material from all different sources across, you know, 120 plus years. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. It's um, it is a it, it's a, an incredible challenge. It's a fascinating uh, job to be doing. Um, we in the rights and contracts team, obviously, we work uh, various ways with the collections in the archive. Sometimes this is uh, where we're getting representation deals to enable uh, 
uh, John and his team to work with those collections and license them out, as well as for the BFI to do its own uh, its own projects with the work. Um, I think the main challenges are um, the outside of the collections that we uh, either fully own, a lot of the previously nationalised industry collections like um, the Transport Film, Mining Review, um, uh, an awful lot of the material the BFI doesn't have uh, any rights to. So a lot of our work is actually then researching uh, who may have the rights to these collections. Um, and that will obviously, it'll be, because we're talking about a whole lot of, you know, commercial productions, uh, non-fiction, documentary, amateur films, animation, there's so many different genres that we're working across. Um, they themselves will have very different amounts of information associated with them, which means that rights research can be either quite straightforward, uh, but probably more more than not, it is more complicated and takes a lot of time to dig around to try and find out who might now have rights um, and whether that's something then that we get the rights uh, to be able to then work on. Um, obviously, with film and any moving image works, there are the added complexities of the multiple layers of rights. So we're dealing not just with those who uh, own the completed programs, but obviously the contributors um, and all the third party rights that we have to be uh, aware of and looking into. So it's a, it's a big job. Um, and um, you know, with projects we've been doing, especially around the digitization projects, that's enabled us uh, to have slightly more resource to carry out more research. So we are trying to build up um, more information about rights as far as we can um, to help basically with the, uh, the all the projects that um, John Gillian and Simon work on as well. So it's a never-ending piece of work. <laughs> You're busy bees. <laughs> so we are able to yeah. provide access to. So if if somebody's interested in in a piece of footage that is is not owned by the BFI or out of copyright, what are the ways? I mean, this hmm. may be for one for John as well. I mean, what are the ways that we can kind of include that in any any sort of licensing deal or or creative reuse project? It will. It will. Uh, yeah. It'll. It'll depend specifically on the on the actual use, the, the specific requirements. Um, uh, the BFI itself benefits from a number of exceptions to copyright, which means we can make things available, say, on the media tech. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of licensing, I'm sure John will have more to say on this, but um, obviously we have very good relationships with a lot of rights holders of the materials that we hold. So um, we fairly often are working with John's team um, to provide advice or help in terms of how to secure those permissions um, if they're not something that we already already have the rights to. Uh, so don't John, be put off I think is the message and yeah John how, how do we provide yeah, I mean, access yeah. to that? I mean our, our stance is you know what we never do is kind of like put a, some kind of brick wall if the materials at the archive we'll try our utmost to see whether there's actually a copyright holder um, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, the materials are held there for research purposes, mainly for student access. But if there's a use for them, then we can check the paper trail, whether it's through, um, you know, the donor access records or, you know, similar productions that were created by a director if there was one there. So, you know, there, there are different paths in terms of actually trying to find, you know, a rights holder for that material. But we, we, you know, we try our utmost never to actually build a brick wall and say you can't access that. Great. I'm going to move on to Gillian, and we're going to talk. I thought maybe we'd talk a bit about more bespoke kind of collaborative working. That is something that you've really been focusing on in in your role, and how we sort of build more bespoke kind of collaborations for for broadcast projects. Do you, do you want to say a bit more about how you know the the, the potential ways of working on that side? No, it, and it's super, super exciting because while my role it is across all of the BFI, I work loads with the archive because, as John has, has said, it's such a vast, vast, fantastic ideas resource. And, and I'm just picking up on what Annie has said as well, is when you're sort of developing content for broadcast and you sort of think, oh, gosh, you know, are the rights we work as a great team so that the rights are really not a problem at all. So what we sort of say is that if you're going to work collaboratively on a broadcast proposition, film and film culture and TV and its culture has to be at the heart of it. So you can approach the BFI and you can say, I'd like some 
some archive and that can be sold to you and or you can work with this collaboratively and if you work with this collaboratively then what we can offer is a really really bespoke way of working with you and it could be on a big partnership uh, on any content as long as it's a broadcast platform so from you know linear streamers radio podcasts and what we'll do is we'll, we'll work a creative session where us four will probably be in it and we'll pull in the relevant other curators and then what we'll do is we'll in interrogate what, what um, the narratives that we want to tell about the archive and we'll work with you to what your priorities are as well and so where we can come up with a bespoke proposition and either we will pitch that together or we will take it to commissioners or, or you can take it to commissioners and then if that gets commissioned then we can offer John De waves like a magic um, uh, can I say this, John, like a, a bespoke rate, depending on how much archive, how much film and film culture is in the broadcast proposition. So that's fabulous. And that takes us a lot of time, but we really, really want to make um, and amplify our archive out to a vast audience. So we will spend that time working with you. And then we can also offer filming locations. Um, Burke Hampstead is, is like amazing. You saw a bit of it in the trailer that we showed. Fantastic um, location, as is Gaydon, where all the sort of Hitchcocks and David Lean films are kept at minus five. Uh, we can offer previews at South Bank. We can put content onto BFI Player to amplify it. We have an amazing press and social team. So we can just build and build and build. So what we're trying to say is that the archive is this vast, literally a vast vault of creative content to inspire ideas and we would love to work with you whether it's as a commissioner whether it's as a broadcaster whether it's as a producer brilliant thanks Gillian and I think we've got a nice little clip from one of our recent broadcast collaborations so thanks to Plimsoll Productions um, for, for, for working oh. with us on this. this this was a a doc that you might have seen recently yeah. called make up a glamorous history so we've got a little clip from the episode that shows our uh, senior curator of special collections, Claire Smith. And this, this clip's quite good to show that we do have these incredible paper collections. So Gillian, did you want to say any more about that just before we do the clip about that, that collaboration? <laughs> Yeah, that was that was brilliant. So we've worked uh, quite a lot with Plimsoll Productions and what was great was this commission happened and because we have that narrative and that dialogue going, they said, look, we could act, film is really important for this episode. And so Claire Smith, the senior curator of Special Collections and Bryony Dixon, uh, head of silent film at BFI, were uh, actually acted as consultants on um, episode three and featured within it. But the clip we're going to show is what is great is that I was not aware until I joined the BFI about the special collections, which is it, it's fast papers, scripts, photos, stills, posters, fan magazines. Uh, and it's a, an untapped resource and, is, and hasn't been used a lot in broadcast. So, um, so we offered consultation on this, we helped shape the narrative, we offered film locations and um, we, Bryony was filmed but the clip we're going to show you is with Claire and uh, presenter Lisa, Lisa Eldridge. Brilliant, could we, could we have the clip please? I think it's called um, History of Beauty, the actual file name for the next clip. Fab. Thanks for that. Um, and now John, I think mentioned the Victorian Film Project where we, we digitized and, and in some cases remastered all of the surviving um, films made in Victorian Britain. So from the sort of dawn of cinema. So there's more than 500 on BFI Player now. So there's a huge sort of untapped resource there, but we did do a couple of really interesting kind of broadcast collaborations around that collection, including with Academy Seven, another great production company we work with um, on a series called Victorian Sensations with Philippa Perry. And there was a lot of BFI material featured through the three episodes. And then the, the final part really focused in on a sort of film story about Victoria, the, the Victorian era and, and the introduction of film. So I think we've got a nice little showreel of the Victorian film collection, which includes some examples of these incredible 68 millimeter large format films, which form part of the collection. They're almost like the IMAX films of their day. And we have actually shown them in the BFI IMAX and they look absolutely incredible, high resolution, beautiful. And you'll probably spot them in this trailer we're about to show you. So maybe if we um, if we show the Victorian film showreel and then Gillian, might, maybe you can say a bit more about um, 
the Victorian Sensations collaboration. So could we have Absolutely. the show of this? Yeah. Brilliant. Yes, so I mean, you can just see how fabulous that is, and there's at least at least 500 titles. So even though we've worked with broadcast uh, on broadcast uh, commissions already with, with the content, there it's so vast. There's many different ways of telling um, the, uh, another story, another narrative with with that content. But um, 2019 was uh, the 200th anniversary of Queen Victoria's birthday. We collaborated with the BBC, uh, a lot of institutions were sort of marking the anniversary and so we worked very closely with Academy 7 uh, to try and help format and tell that narrative that film narrative in one of the episodes and I think what for me was brilliant is working with the curatorial team because um, Bryony Dixon who you'll see in a minute in the clip um, she is like a legend on silent film and when she when when you sort of look at sort of black and white and early film you sort of go oh all right I've seen that before but actually you haven't because when she tells the narrative of that early Victorian film about the entrepreneurial nature of the camera people, the YouTubeness of them, it was a new medium. It had only just occurred and within a few years the new grammar had, had been written and a new way of looking at the world had suddenly had happened and these camera people were taking the content around to music halls and suddenly that becomes really exciting um, and you start to think of TV ideas out of that. So we worked closely with Academy 7 and they uh, interviewed um, Brian with uh, Philippa Perry and one of uh, Philippa also came down to South Bank and we, we shot um, some interviews with her there as well. And then just to say, as part of that collaboration, we also worked with Blue Peter and CBBC and uh, Lion TV with Horrible Histories. So we, yeah. so because we were working with Academy 7, we suddenly went, actually, this can reach audiences from, from young people right through to older people. So we managed to get a lot of uh, amplification for such an important collection. Um, there was so a very was funny sequence with with horrible histories in the uh, with Rattus in the sewers. They, they they put the BFI archive in a sewer, unfortunately, but it's very funny with some sort of yeah. poo floating past the, the reels. So to rest assured, we don't keep our films in a sewer. But it was it was it was just a new angle on the collections for us as well. So that was that was a fun one. But yeah, I think we've got a little clip from episode three of Victorian Sensations that Gillian mentioned. Okay, and that was in, was that Ali Pali? That was in Ali Pali, but uh, as I said, we, yeah. but, but we also provided opportunities for other filming locations for the programme as well. And we did a, a preview of it down at uh, BFI South Bank with a Q&A as well. So we could um, get people to, uh, and particularly journalists, to look at the programme in advance as well. So we could help enhance press and social media coverage uh, of the content. Brilliant. Thanks, Gillian. And now I know there are there are projects that we've done over the last sort of ten to fifteen years that that go beyond kind of a broadcast realm and broadcast part of it. But we have worked with a number of filmmakers on some really exciting sort of creative reuse archive documentary projects where that they've kind of had a, a theatrical life and a festival life as well. Um, Queer Armour's one, you might remember, the Open Doc Fest in 2017, and that tied in with the big season we were putting on at BFI to mark the 50th anniversary of the the, the partial decriminalisation of homosexuality. Um, this big season called Gross Indecency we put on. So, And that was a film that, um, that Daisy worked on using, you know, largely using the BFI's LGBTQ+, um, film and TV collections that we've done a lot of work over the years to kind of curate and research and make available on our on our different platforms. So, so Queer Arm is one example of that. Um, another one, Arcadia, which um, appeared, which had a theatrical run, DVD publishing and so on, but also was put out in the BBC Arena strand. So we work, we've worked quite closely with BBC on those two. And then looking further back, we've got projects like The Big Melt, which is another DocFest um, connection and collaboration where um, we used our industrial heritage collections, in this case, steelmaking, wonderful archive of, of the steelmaking industry um, and the Sheffield area. And Jarvis Cocker and Martin Wallace sort of used that footage and 
and made this incredible collage using using Jarvis's music as well. Um, so music's a really important part of this kind of discussion, <laughs> and we're always interested to to talk to filmmakers that are, are, are interested in working with archive in new and creative ways, and also bringing in other artists, musicians, for instance. So Queerama had the, the music of John Grant um, over it. Um, Arcadia was mu musicians from Portishead and Goldfrap, including Adrian Utley contributed a new score to that. So, so I think music's worth flagging here as an important kind of part of that. Um, Another project was Julian Temple's London, the Modern Babylon, which drew on our really vast collection of London London films. So I think just to flag that there is, there is there can be this potential for a bit of a network of both kind of traditional broadcast, but also theatrical home home publishing kind of output. So I think we've got a little clip from Arcadia, which sort of take used some of our newly digitised Britain on film rural material to tell this sort of quite dark kind of folk horror fairy tale about what we've done to our countryside. So could we play a clip from Arcadia, please? Great, that's worth just reiterating that we, we do work with archives around the world and around the UK as well on projects like this. So, I mean, the Victorian one, the I, I Film Institute in the Netherlands were, were really crucial. So, and with Arcadia, our, our partners around the UK contributed. So it, we're very much into sort of collaborating with other archives in these sort of projects. Um, as, as we're on the subject of music, I mean, I think particularly when we're doing our big silent restorations, we, we're often working on commissioning new scores for things. So for instance, we work with Simon Fisher Turner, who did these incredible two scores for the, um, the Epic of Everest and the Great White Silence. The, the, the latter was about Captain Scott's final, final kind of expedition. Um, and the Great White uh, Epic of Everest was about the, the 1924 Mallory and Irving attempt on Everest. So these incredible kind of like irreplaceable records of, of kind of moments in our history that the BFI National Archive has restored um, to their sort of full glory, including all the original tints and tones, but without a kind of music score to sort of really bring them to life, you know, it's, it's so crucial. So I think the, the ways that we can work with musicians, we're always, we're always interested to explore that, to explore that, that avenue. Um, on, on that note, another of our silent features preserved in the archive called Shiraz from the late twenties, which is one of the only surviving feature films made in the silent era, era in India. And it's basically the love, a love story about the creation of the Taj Mahal. It's beautiful. Um, and so that was one of our big restorations. And as part of that, we worked with Anushka Shankar, who, who uh, composed a sitar score for the film. And Gillian, do you want to say a little bit about the, about the collaboration with BBC Studios on that, that doc that sort of accompanied the, the restoration? Yeah, it was uh, part of uh, under the strand of uh, what do artists do all day for BBC Four, and what was lovely about it is, is we followed Anushka BBC Studios uh, Productions uh, worked on it, uh, produced it, and it just told that story of what goes in, you know, to make a a, a score, particularly for a silent film. And what's lovely is is that because Anushka brings you in into the documentary, uh, you suddenly then learn about this silent film. And like Simon said, it's a love story of the Taj Mahal. And you absolutely, by the end of the program, really, really want to see the film. And so what we did was for the um, we collaborated with BBC and we actually put the film for free uh, for a month on to. Um, uh, B, uh, BFI player Annie did her magic waving the rights and so that as a viewer if you watched uh, this sort of magical journey of what goes in uh, to do a score for a silent film and at the end of it you go but I really really want to see this film then you could and um, and then what was fantastic we had enormous traffic to a uh, BFI player so for us it was a fantastic sort of um, sort of great win in a way that we managed to get so many viewers watching a silent movie that they may not have done otherwise and this was through the power of the, of the broadcast um, show. 
Definitely. So we've got a little clip that I think shows Robin Baker, who's our head curator, just talking about the project and a little bit of Anushka working on the score. And you'll see a little bit of the the premiere at the Barbican, the premiere screening of the restoration and, and live performance. So I think we'll have that little clip and then I'll, I'll come back to, to John and Annie and just talk a bit more about education and non-commercial use of archives. So could we have the Anushka clip, please? Brilliant. And thanks to BBC Studios for that clip. And it's worth saying that we look after the, the, the biggest collection of film shot in pre-independence India in the world. So a lot of that you can also explore now on BFI Player. So um, it's another one of our big kind of international collections. I'm just going to come back to um, John and Annie. And I thought maybe if we've got a little bit of time left, just to say a bit about how we may work on more sort of non-commercial, non in some cases non-broadcast projects with the archive so I know we do we will do um, academic placements we've got a, a PhD student at the moment working with the special collections team on Peter Wallen's archive and his, his notebooks um, but we also do projects like archives for education and work with organizations like Adam Matthew so maybe Annie I could start with you for just a quick a quick run through of yeah, those sure. sort of projects if, Absolutely, yeah. The, so the main one, the Archives for Education Make Film History project is actually led by Kingston School of Art, um, but it's a project uh, that makes available around 200 films from the BFI National Archive, BBC, uh, Northern Ireland Screen and the Irish Film Institute. Um, and these are made available uh, to those um, uh, young filmmakers in schools and film training and higher education institutions uh, to be able to uh, make use of clips uh, for, for creative reuse, so to um, produce their own material as part of, it doesn't have to be necessarily as part of coursework, but a lot of it is, um, so to obviously watch uh, these films from the various archives and uh, respond to those. Um, that project's been running since 2017. I think we have over about 73 or so institutions signed up across the UK and Ireland, um, and it's forever growing. And um, we are looking to, uh, at the moment, it's all done through licensing, the creative reuse aspect of it. Um, but I think the, the scheme will continue to evolve. Um, and obviously, the, there's work going on to sort of look at other partnerships that could um, get involved in that, and I would, I would hope to be able to find, you know, other ways to manage uh, and facilitate creative reuse. Um, this is obviously particularly focused on film. It's a really exciting project, and it's, it started with I think well films just from the BFI, and a few years later we've got over 200 from four four major collections. So um, it's a really exciting exciting project. Brilliant, thanks, Annie. John, did you want to say anything about how you, your, you and your team contribute to educational initiatives? Sure. Well, recently, um, well, I say recently, we've been working with Adam Matthew Digital. Now, they're a provider of primary source digital products for use in the higher education market. We've been working with them for about, I think we're coming to 10 years now. But the most recent project, which was quite ambitious, was the whole idea of digitizing a collection from the BFI, namely the ETV collection, which is, I think it's roughly around 6,000 to 7,000 socialist titles. So these were propaganda films um, made from socialist countries, so Soviet Union and China. Now I said 7,000 titles, now in terms of hours, that equates to probably around 750 hours worth of content. So, you know, they took an ambitious task of actually digitizing a lot of the raw material, 16 mil, 35 mil, and then publishing them uh, through their uh, online uh, product, um, which is now available across the globe, as like I've said, you know, to higher ed education institutions. So, you know, that's a great example of ways where we can work outside the usual kind of like broadcast domain. The whole idea is based around, you know, what collections do we have? Um, that hasn't been you know, properly uh, interrogated since we acquired them and how can they be used outside of like, you know, outside of the usual kind of like broadcast kind of like uses. In this instance, it would have been for education. Brilliant. And I think there's quite a, a nice little trailer for the Socialism on Film project. If you go to YouTube and I think on the Adam Matthews site, I think if you just type Socialism on Film, 
Adam Matthew will probably come up. But there is, I thought I thought I'd sort of like gone a bit show real crazy. But I wish I'd sort of got that one to show you. But you should be able to find it. So um, please put your questions in the chat for us. I think we, we're running over a bit, probably till about quarter past, just because we had a bit of a hiccup at the beginning. So I think maybe while while the questions are just coming through, I see there's one one's coming already. I think maybe should we. Unless anyone else wanted to say any more before we move to questions, I thought we've got that last clip of Bryony we could squeeze in. Unless any of you wanted to kind of just jump in, jump in on anything that you hadn't managed to kind of squeeze in so far. Just to Maybe. say, uh, get, please get in touch with us. We really want to yeah. get uh, the BFI, BFI archive out to, uh, you know, to a wide audience. And so please do contact us and we can set up some creative sessions and we can work out how we can work together. Um, so please do get in touch with us. Definitely. I think our emails are going to be in the chat. And so any kind of any further queries you think of, you know, do drop us a line. Um, have we got one actually we've got a question here so i think this probably a few of us could aren't sort of help to answer this so marianne asks if i wanted to use footage or work in partnership for a project with a museum in north wales would footage be subject to commercial rates or would it depend on the individual pieces of footage now i presume what you mean is to actually use footage within an actual exhibition context within the museum. So John, do you want to talk a bit about how your team sort of approaches those sort of non-commercial yeah, uses of footage? Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, with all museum requests that come in, it's the usual who, why, what, when, where. Our rates are going to be bespoke to the particular project. Um, I believe in this instance, because it's going to be non-commercial, then there would be a subsidised rate. So it wouldn't be in the region that we would charge, you know, the likes of, say, the V&A. Um, but, it, you know, it's, it also depends on the material itself, whether it's BFI rights owned or not. Mm. So I think really in those instances, it's just best to contact myself or one of the team and just to kind of state exactly, you know, what material you're looking for, the subject themes, you know, because what we can also do is carry out some research across the wider collection. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. So it, is, it does tend to be, a, because there's such a complex kind of web of of rights and kind of um, ownership of the material it it does tend to be something we have to do on a sort of case-by-case -case basis but we certainly do license and, and make available material to to exhibitions large and small and we recently provided some footage for a not on a, on a non-commercial level to a holocaust education project which was um a project all about the the kids that were kind of rescued from the concentration camps and and brought over and kind of given a new life in different parts of the UK and so for a project like that we had some incredible footage of the the kids arriving who'd, who'd actually been rescued from Belson and so for something like that it just feels like it's not appropriate to do it as a commercial job so it, it's an educational holocaust education project so i think the point is to just ask us if you have something in mind or if you want to know what we've got and if there's a particular project like like this exhibition in wales you know just 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 talk to us and we can obviously talk you through the process so yeah definitely um, don't, don't be shy <laughs> give us a call send us an email um you know we can break it down for you always it always helps to be detailed but then again you know that's why we have telephones and that's why we have computers indeed so we've got another one through <laughs> excuse me double screening um richard asks when looking to talk about a collaborative project is it best to come armed with defined ideas or is it possible to discuss options and explore possible ways forward thanks richard um, Gillian, I mean, definitely, I mean, we, maybe you can take that one. I would say we, we, yeah. we're open to. We're open, basically. We're open. So it might be that uh, you've spoken to a commissioner and there is a, an area of interest that you want to discuss with us and see how we could work together. Um, so, yeah, we just really open for, for a discussion. I mean, often we, or, or you, 
we have sometimes um, archive collections and archive, archive narratives that we're really keen to explore. So it might be we can share what we're interested in, you share what you're interested in. Um, some people come who have already got commissions. We're always having uh, regular chats with commissioners and sort of know the landscape of, uh, of interest. So that's why we keep saying everything is quite bespoke, depending on the producer, the production company, um, the broadcasters. Um, so basically, just get in touch with us and we will try and make um, a, you know, a, a session with you happen. That'd be great. Definitely. And I, I think it's... I, I, I always it, like the idea. Sorry, go for it, John. I always like the idea of tapping into the resource, which is the curators. We've, been, we've already seen some amazing clips of Claire and Bryony and Simons has been talking about, you know, the, the absolute vastness of the archive. So, you know, the team all have their in, unique kind of like skill sets. And I'm sure one of the ideas that they have will chime with probably an idea that you might have. And it's kind of like piecing it all together. I mean, personally, we can I can look and provide bits and bobs of COI material, and that can start the ingredients of, you know, a potential collaboration or, you know, alternatively, just an archive cell. It really is just kind of like just meeting up with us and then just pitching your ideas and seeing where, you know, what we can achieve from it. And picking and it up maybe on that, it chimes with yeah. something that's actually on our sort of cultural plan as an organisation yeah. as well. So, I mean, an example of that would be, so I'm in, I'm in my curatorial role involved in programming a season around the theme of exploration for the beginning of next year because it's the centenary of the death of Shackleton. Bryony's working on a big kind of DVD box set of early Antarctic films. We're remastering the film South, which is about Shackleton's um, trip to the Antarctic where he, the ship got stuck. Um, so there's things like that where it's on our sort of cultural plan. It's something we're doing either in venue or online. And so there's, there's, there are chances sort of in our future plan to really tap into things where there'll be, there'll be wider BFI activity. And that obviously helps us to, um, to really amplify the project because we can sort of get more of our colleagues involved, you know. So, but that's not to say it, it has to tie in with something we're already doing. So we're, we're always open to, open to ideas and suggestions. So, so I think just, just contact us. Sorry, Gillian, I interrupted you there. No, no, you've just said it perfectly. What I was going to say was um, what we haven't really, really made a big deal about, and John has just said it wonderfully, is the curatorial team. Because, because the archive is so vast and a lot of it actually isn't digitised, a lot of it potentially hasn't been broadcast, because we have such fantastic expertise, uh, film knowledge and TV knowledge, that what, what we do is we then pair up the curatorial team to the idea. So you have this like fantastic expert knowledge, which is why uh, often the curatorial uh, curators act as consultants on the programme as well as being in it. Um, so that's one thing I think we offer a, a, as a unique resource, uh, which potentially other archive collections don't. And only by talking with us and only by talking with the curatorial team do those narratives really get untapped. So every time I'm in a, in a session, it's super exciting because one of them will say something and I go, what? That's a whole program in that just alone. And, and their knowledge is really, really not to be underestimated. Yeah. And if you just want B-roll, licensing some B-roll footage, that's totally fine too. You know, you can talk to John and co and they're incredibly knowledgeable about our collections too. So there are, I think just to get across with today, there's there's different ways of working with us and, and we can help you with all the sort of complexities of rights and and also steer you if it's easier to material that's, that's quicker for us to license too. So um, I think we're, I'm just double checking if, there, if there's any other questions i'd send them now i think our emails are in the chat so i think if there's if there's no more questions coming through we'll we'll probably wrap up but i'd just like to thank my my three colleagues for joining us today and for your time i'd like to thank all of you at home or wherever you are for tuning into this session and for bearing with us we really were guinea pigs we had some, few gremlins at the beginning um, and thanks so much to the, the tech team for kind of resolving that. Um, I'd also like to really thank DocFest, all at DocFest for having us and hosting this session for us. I hope that you enjoy the rest of the festival. Um, our, our emails are all in the chat um, so do drop us a line. Just a reminder, check out BFI Player, check out our collections database, look out for more announcements about 
our, our library platform coming later next year and just yeah drop a, drop us a line and i hope you enjoy the rest of docfest and the rest of your day thank you